Welcome to the Chaos and Light podcast. I am your host, Angela Levesque, and this podcast is all about exploring mind, mystery, and human potential. On today's episode, we have Jonathan DePotter, and we are talking about plant medicine therapy, um, kind of exploring the different types of plant-based medicine, who is it for, how you prepare for one of the retreats, And we talk about some of the uh, issues with it becoming more mainstream. Uh, If you haven't checked out chaosandlight.com, please do so. We add tons of new stuff all the time. Um, And if you find yourself in the midst of a transition or looking for guidance, I suggest you check out the uh, offerings page. If you'd like to know more about myself and um, the services I provide, check out chaosandlight.com. Well, we will be back after this ridiculously short break. Are you enjoying this podcast and want to help this lady out? Well, share it with friends or even better, leave a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear from you. Now back to the show. I'm here today with Jonathan DePotter. He is the founder and CEO of Behold Retreats, a bespoke wellness service that facilitates journeys of self-discovery and transformation, supported by the scientifically proven benefits of plant medicine therapy. He's passionate about raising awareness on the benefits of plant medicine therapy and its potential to improve well-being and mental health outcomes. Originally from Hawaii, Jonathan is currently based in Bangkok, Thailand, traveling often to continue his research into the best plant-based medicine retreat centers around the world. He enjoys yoga, medicine, surfing, and is energized by big, bold ideas. I would like to welcome Jonathan to the Chaos and Light podcast. How are you doing today? I'm really well, Angela. Thank you for having me. I, uh, I'm really excited to talk about this. Um, people who've been listening to my podcast know that I have done a lot of, um, I guess, experimentation with psychedelics uh, recreationally, but I've also done some really deep spiritual work with shamans and such. So this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. So I always like to start with my guests uh, asking you kind of how did you, uh, what, tell us a little bit about the journey that led you to creating these retreats. Yeah, sure. So I guess, um, you know, I I grew up in in Hawaii, as you mentioned, and it's a very substance rich environment. And so uh, witnessing what I did there really kept me away from substances, because I just saw there was a lot of negativity and darkness surrounding the whole concept of of substance use, whether it's alcohol or weed, or, you know, any of the more, quote, unquote, stronger uh, substances that are out there. And so um, for me, it, it was actually, you know, the it was actually kind of reaching a stage in my career at age 32, 33, where I had all the kind of outer world success, I guess, that one might look for, but I still wasn't very happy, right? And I just thought, I remember reaching a point where I was thinking, there's just got to be more to life, you know, as the next promotion, the next client, the next deal isn't going to give me any incremental happiness. And so there has to be something more to life. And I was actually an atheist at the time. And so I decided, you know, to kind of on a bit of a whim, take a year off from work. Uh, I was doing management consulting work in Hong Kong at that time, leading leading a large team and decided to take a year off. And as part of that, a couple of friends came and joined me in Peru and we had a very transformational and mind opening, door opening, soul opening experience at uh, at a retreat center there with ayahuasca in Peru. And so prior to that, were you doing, you said you're an atheist, but were you doing any sort of meditation or anything else that was kind of um, uh, opening yourself up, building a Uh, sense of self-awareness? I was doing about 16 hours a day of work. I was uh, drinking a lot. Um, uh, <laughs> so <no. laughs> with, <laughs> yeah, so it was it was uh, it was a work hard, play hard sort of lifestyle, which which is very much the norm in uh, you know amongst uh, Hong Kong expats. And uh, I know you, you mentioned you were just living in Japan. I imagine it's it's often quite the same for foreigners that are living in uh, in Japan as well. Yes. Well, so you have this this kind of transformational experience. And then, and then what was next for you? Then you decided, hey, this is something I want to bring to, uh, you know, other people like me, or were you kind of uh, market to people that are more like me that were already sort of in the spiritual world and meditating and that sort of thing? Yeah, so, so actually, you know, the retreat itself was by far the most challenging few days of my life. I wasn't prepared for it. It was 
overwhelmingly challenging on all dimensions. And uh, I wasn't able to integrate the experience well, if I'm to be honest. So I couldn't quite make sense of it. I, did, I wasn't really, as I shared, uh, prepared. I wasn't really well guided post-retreat. They kind of handed me a one piece of paper and said, hey, you might try some uh, Vipassana meditation. That's probably good for you. And uh, so, uh, you know, through that experience, I, I honestly, I kind of returned to who I was pre-retreat. Um, over the the weeks and the months that followed and then I found myself on another retreat some you know months later and then returning back to who I was and I was on that sort of a cycle going to a number of these you know leading retreats around the globe um, but struggling to integrate the experience and it wasn't you know wasn't well guided in relation to that and so once I did find some private healers in fact that did a lot more to prepare me, uh, facilitate the experience and help me integrate the experience that the breakthroughs that were possible just came quickly, easily. And they were just so much more powerful than my years of attempts at all these kind of five-star retreat centers. So that was kind of, for me, a big, a big aha moment in relation to, well, if you've got this, you know, quote unquote, so wrong, or, you know, I mean, it, it all unfolds as it's meant to, but if, if you were missing out on the deeper benefits for, for three and a half years, trying at all these different five-star retreat centers, then that's likely to also be the case for others. And so I, that began me on a, on a fact-finding mission, I suppose, in relation to other friends' experiences, and then, you know, interviewing people and understanding really where they were at, the breakthroughs that they were having. Um, and that, that really, Built the motivation to establish Behold Retreats. And so, you know, the, the way that I look at this work now is it's not so much about psychedelics as such, but rather around understanding ourselves. So what are the, our own mental and emotional blind spots? And then how can plant medicine, how can psychedelics play a role in helping us, you know, release, um, release those blind spots and release those emotions uh, from, from the body and, and rewire the mind so that we can, you know, remove all negativity and all of those sorts of good things. Um, without that preparation without the guidance around the integration it really is quite difficult in, in my own experience and what we've seen with clients as well to integrate these experiences to um, to sustain an elevated consciousness which is uh, ultimately what what people are looking for you know they don't really want to go on an ayahuasca retreat or a psilocybin retreat what they're looking for is improvements to the quality of everyday life I mean don't get me wrong these experiences are are magical and profound but that's not really what they're looking for they're, they're wanting to improve everyday life and so that's really our focus is you know, yes, the retreats are amazing and they're beautiful, but what you're actually looking for is, is the quality of life improvement. Okay. Well, I have so many follow-ups to that, but I want to, I want to uh, take a step back first and talk about some of the, the different types of um, plant medicines that you use and what are the, the difference between them and what, you know, what can somebody expect on whether they go and do psilocybin or ayahuasca, for example. Yeah, sure. So um, probably for the sake of brevity, I'll speak predominantly about the three medicines that we work with. And I'll mention a few others that um, your audience may be interested in. Um, so we predominantly work with psilocybin, ayahuasca, and 5-MeO-DMT. Um, psilocybin, I think, is a beautiful medicine for you know people who are just ready to dip the toe as it were it's an amazing medicine can be very powerful as well but i think it's a it's an it's a good place to start because it's relatively easy on the physical body and um it's relatively easy to uh shall we say manage the dosage uh, in relation to to the individual so you know for people who are a little bit nervous a little bit fearful um but they recognize and understand the benefits and wanting to get started. I think psilocybin is a really beautiful medicine for, for that. Um, also known as magic mushrooms, if the, the word psilocybin sounds a bit, you know, medical. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, uh, and then ayahuasca. So ayahuasca is super powerful medicine. Um, you know, it, it is more physically demanding. Um, people often hear about the purgative effects. Uh, it detoxify. It, it often is um, spoken about in relation to its detoxification effects on the body and the fact that it starts there. Um, so uh, often, you know, people go and they're really excited about their ayahuasca retreat and perhaps there's a bunch of, de you know, of toxicity in the body. And so they can sit three or four ceremonies and it's just, 
it's just agony because the body is moving all this toxicity the you know the preservatives and the and the the remnants of alcohol and all these you know lower level energies out of the physical body before we can move up and harmonize and move up into higher states of consciousness and have you know visions and spiritual insights and all of those things that we you know we're hoping to get from the experience and so um but but again the medicine is very powerful in terms of what it can do on in terms of you know, physical healing as well. And so often when we've got clients that come to us, you know, the, the ones that really want to throw themselves into it and, and immerse themselves, you know, ayahuasca is, 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 is a beautiful medicine. In particular, I think for those people who are suffering from any sort of physical ailments, that's not an area that we really focus upon. Um, but we've had clients that have healed their autoimmune disorders, clients that have come out and said like, wow, I've never had, um, you know, I've got such a clear vision. And I was like, oh, great. You know, you know what you want to do with your life now? And she's like, no, no, no. I've never been able to see like this in my entire life. And it's like, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Um, so there's a lot of great science out there that's coming in relation to, you know, uh, for all of these medicines, candidly for PTSD, anxiety, depression, etc. Um, and that's all beautiful. And that's all great. But again, that's not really where we focus. Um, the, the modern narrative in relation to psychedelics at the moment is very much in relation to helping people from getting from the very lower levels of consciousness to a better level of consciousness, right? So that's the, the addictions, depression, anxiety, PTSD, all that stuff. Now, I think that's that's overlooking what I believe to be the much more exciting opportunity, which is to bring people to much higher and sustain much higher levels of consciousness. Um, and uh, and of course, we don't want people to be suffering. We want them to be better. Um, but it actually, in my experience, um, given what I shared before, it actually it's much, it takes a lot more to get from a low level of consciousness to a, to a better level of consciousness than it does to get from a good a base level of consciousness to, to sustain a higher level. Um, and so that's why I think a lot of the narrative really revolves uh, around the lower levels of consciousness, because these are very powerful medicines. The energetic work, which is something we might get into because you said you've worked with some shamans, that's very poorly understood, particularly in the West. Uh, and so that's part of why a lot of people go down and say work with uh, shamans in Peru or um, Costa Rica, et cetera, is because th there's, there's energetic work that's being done by people who are capable uh, with that work. And you know, typically speaking, those aren't the people who have gone through a two-year course at CIAS or Johns Hopkins or any of the you know more medically oriented institutions uh, and then the last medicine is um, is 5-MeO DMT now I think this medicine is getting an incredible amount of attention these days it's, it's certainly on the up we see a lot more of our clients gravitating in that direction it's a very powerful experience generally recognized as four to six times more powerful than ayahuasca so we do a lot of vetting with our clients to make sure that they're genuinely ready for that experience because it is uh, it is super powerful mystical non-dual experience within five to ten seconds uh, reality itself breaks apart from from our visage and we are shot out of our physical body and into oneness with the universe so it's 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 a super overwhelmingly powerful experience it opens up you know because it moves us into such a high state it really does or or a low state depending on the direction of the travel um it really does open us up uh, energetically and emotionally and so it's very important to be number one well prepared but also very well guided and facilitated physically, mentally, emotionally, energetically, in order to make sure that, um, you know, safety is, is first and foremost in relation to these experiences. So I hope that gives a bit of an overview, a bit of a monologue. I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great overview. And I have done, it wasn't DMT, but it was something very similar where, yes, within seconds, um, myself as my identity no longer, I, I was no longer aware of myself as a body or a being and just everything broke open. And that is amazing and um, terrifying. And even at the time, you don't have the, the self awareness to say this is terrifying because that even that um, ability to, to, to speak in that term is not there, which is very different from psilocybin, where you're still aware of Angela as the person and there's an identity and you're having this, again, this kind of breaking open, but it's completely different from just all of a sudden within seconds, boom, like you said, you're, you're one with the universe and you understand. And uh, yeah, that's not for the faint of heart, for sure. There's a certain amount of preparation and, um, yeah, consideration to, to have that experience. And to be honest, I haven't, um, I haven't been ready though. I think that I'm, I'm almost ready again to have an experience like that because it was so 
um, I don't know, like there's not even, there's not even words that, that you can, you can, <laughs> you know, use to, to describe it other than a complete breaking open, but. What was, what, what was the medicine, if I may ask? Uh, it was actually a, a seed called Soma. Uh -huh. Are you familiar with that? I am. I am. Absolutely. It's, uh, well, it's often Soma is referring to uh, Mimosa Jurema or Mimosa Preta. Um, and it's uh, DM DMT based, right? So um, was it, um, did you have it in liquid form? No, we actually smoked it. <laughs> you smoked it. Got it. Yes. Got it. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, it's, um, it's a powerful medicine. In fact, um, I, I recently had the privilege and honor to do a Soma ceremony with my mother. Uh, and that was her, her first. So it was a really, it was a really beautiful experience. Yes, it was an amazing, like I, like I said, there's not even words really, you can try and describe it. And to be honest, there's so much of it that I, I don't know that I could recall. And yet I know that it, it left its imprint on me, even though I can't go back and say, oh, and then this happened. And then this happened. It, it was, um, uh, yeah, that it's not even possible. And like I said, it, I know that it it did some really deep work within myself that that I can't speak to, yeah, um, yeah. or okay. give words to. The way the way I often um, talk about this with clients is to say that like you know it, we're we're being shown a state of being which is possible for us, uh, and then our work as we're returned back into the three D is to begin to make the steps into that direction, and so to have you know this this beacon this this lighthouse just shot out you know like a <laughs> hundred miles down the road a thousand miles infinity miles down the road to be like oh that's what I am and then and then to be able to be brought back into this leave such a significant imprint upon our being so I, I hear what you're saying so I love that you uh talk about preparation because uh I find I think too when we when we hear people like in Silicon Valley and it's kind of the hip thing to do to go and have ayahuasca ceremonies and for me it, especially there's some really deep spiritual work that's happening and like you said there's an integration process after so I think that it can be and, and you spoke to this in some ways a catalyst to a much deeper significant journey than just having that moment with the with the psychedelics and do you worry at all about um you know when yoga came to the west and then we kind of lost a little bit of the soul of yoga and and i think it for something that's as sacred as as plant medicines is there a concern of yours that as it becomes mainstream that it won't that it loses a bit of its soul yeah, I think it's it's a great question, and um, what's what I think is particularly interesting about this question is that everyone in this ecosystem has such a strong perspective, and they're super judgmental about people who don't share their perspective exactly, which is pretty interesting when you think of a group of people who, in theory, in concept, have experienced universal love and you know these higher states of consciousness, and then the finger pointing and the you know the judgment is is so strong and it's so absolute. So I actually you know one of our one of our facilitators and, and practitioners, you know he's he's apprenticed under a shaman um, who's now 102 years old. He's been apprenticing under him for 30 years, and. And he says, he said to me, he said, Jonathan, his name is also actually Jonathan. Uh, he said, Jonathan, ayahuasca is two, is two plants that when they come together can really help people. Anything that's over and above that is nonsense. And, I, and it took me a while to register that. But when I actually made sense of it, because he said, there's so many different lineages, there's so many different cultures, there's so many different traditions. And he goes, these are two plants that when they come together, they can really help people. And, and, and that's just it, right? And I think that, you know, whether we look at the super, you know, super out there vision quests, you know, uh, six days up the mountain, scrambling and crawling, and then you take the ayahuasca at the end of that when you're just, you know, at your wit's end. Or if we talk about, you know, something that's super clinical with a doctor on hand, you know, there's a broad spectrum. And the reality is, in my mind, that um, people, that there should be a, you know, for, taking a purely evolutionary view, there should be a broad spectrum of experiences available with different plant medicine in different contexts. And, and these experiences that are going to resonate 
with a certain type of individual, right? So, so we, we serve a lot of, you know, executive clients and, and, and those sorts of people and people are like, well, why are you, why are you focused on that? Is because you can make a bunch of money. And it's like, well, no, because that's, that's the world that I'm from. And I know how traumatized these people are and how disconnected they are from them, the, from themselves. So I can speak their language and these people need help and they can, you know, make a positive impact and influence upon the broader collective because of their positions, positions of influence. So I tend to take that sort of kind of evolutionary view on the subject, which is like the more people we have offering more experiences and more wisdom from different traditions, beautiful. And the stuff that works will rise to the top and the stuff that doesn't work will, will, will fade away. Uh, and again, there's no right and wrong here. Uh, evolution will decide ultimately what's right for us collectively. Well, I like in, when you first spoke, you talked a lot about uh, the integration after. And I think that that's a really important piece because you go and you have these really expanding experiences and then you come home and, you know, you still have to get your groceries and you still got, <laughs> you know, you still got to do uh, pay your bills and all of the, that stuff. And I think that sometimes it's difficult to go from these really profound experiences and then um, figure out how that experience integrates into our more, you know, mundane realities. And that to me, you, you say you have a, a, on one of the blog posts, you say profound experiences are the norm. Transformation is another story. And um, I want to talk about how you help people integrate some of these really profound experiences in their, in their daily lives. Yeah. And I think the, the question, the question that I always come back to is when I'm speaking with clients post retreat is, what are you going to do differently? And Ooh, that's a good one. It's, you know, the, you, I speak to clients that have gone on, the, you know, the, as a matter of, of status and ego, they jump on the call and, oh yeah, I've already done 50, 50 ceremonies, you know, I'm ready to go. And I'm like, okay, so where were you in life when you started 50 ceremonies ago? Okay, you were doing this, you were doing, and where are you in life now? And how is that, how is that different, right? And, and often what you see is that there's actually not a great deal that's different, which is fascinating. So, so you've done, you've had these 50 ceremonies, profound experiences, potentially life-changing experiences. But if you look at what you're doing, it's the same. So the likelihood of, you know, so either you are already on your divine calling and path and all of those sorts of good things, which is amazing. You probably wouldn't need ayahuasca if that was, if that was the case, or you weren't and you're not, and you're not listening to the messages that are, that are coming through. So when we work with our clients, we always, you know, we focus on, it has to take shape in the form of, in the, in the form of action as we, as we come back from these, these, these experiences, because, you know, ultimately, I, I speak a lot about commitment, but actually it's, you know, commitment in this in this context is interchangeable with self-love or with love, right? And it's love for self, which is going to then be reflected in the outside world. And so to the extent that we prioritize what's going on in our inner world is the extent to which we are going to be able to, to benefit from these uh, experiences. So if you just, you know, as you said, as you come back home, you know, the work pressures are there, the family pressures are there, no one expects you to be any different. Um, and then over time, you know, as we lose the neuroplasticity from the, the benefits of the medicine, it's very easy to fall back into exactly the same grooves because all of the, the shape of everything around us hasn't changed. And so it takes considerable effort to make the shape of things around us change such that we can change. So I always, you know, encourage people to take a couple of days after retreat to anchor them, their new selves outside of their home context, right? So don't go to Costa Rica for a week, have a life-changing experience, and then jump back on a plane and be straight back into work doing the nine to five, because that's your old context. You need a little bit of time to, you know, to, 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 to make sense of that experience and to anchor that new you back into the 3D before you anchor it back into, uh, you know, your, your old world, as it were. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's many aspects to that in terms of uh, the mental, right? So what are the patterns of mind? that you're rewiring and staying super conscious of old entrenched patterns, limiting beliefs, all of those sorts of things. So, you know, the, the National Science Foundation shows that a typical person has between 12,000 and 60,000 thoughts per day. Almost 100% of those thoughts are about self, egoic thoughts, I, me, mine. 95% um, of those thoughts are repetitive. 85% of those are negative. So we're thinking a lot. We're thinking only about ourselves. We're thinking the same thing over and over again. And we're thinking 
bad things about ourselves. So there's so much rewiring to be done. So people have to become super, super hyper conscious of their limiting beliefs and patterns of mind. And then it's the emotional stuff. So releasing out the emotions from the physical body. And so, um, you know, we, we teach our clients practices to really make sure that they are prioritizing that work on a regular basis. So for most people, um, we recommend 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes in the evening, 30 minutes in the morning is about planning your day ahead. Who are you going to be on this day? Uh, and how is that different from the person that you were before? Uh, and then at the end of the day, were you that person? Why not? Where did, where did you not show up? And so it's just, it's getting into that habit of being clear about your future self and, and whether or not you're measuring up to the, to what you know is possible for yourself, because that's, you know, that's how that self-love comes through. It's uh, in, in, in meeting the, expectations that you set for yourself not from like a negative perspective but from like a loving perspective well and I will say that having that experience of and I think I've had this experience you know from a pot cookie to psilocybin to is this to you know some of the to LSD that that experience of oneness that experience of um just having universal love and loving not for, with, to, because, but just having the experience of love and connection. And it's like, if, if even just being able to take a piece of that or, you know, watching the trees breathe or being able to, you know, and you realize that the, the world is so much more interconnected and not, you know, physically, energetically, like on all of these different levels, that experience of oneness to me was the the most profound. Like I remember um, I did LSD the first time when I was 19 and that was a really like blew me out of the water experience. And I was like, I can no longer look at the world the same again. Like there's something now that has fund fundamentally changed. And although you can get back into old habits and you can get, it's almost like you can't, um, unknow what you now know. And so having that experience of, wow, like that universal love, that sense of oneness, that sense of unity, consciousness, that's there, whether I'm choosing to pay attention to it or not. And so then I get to decide how much, if, if I have that knowledge, how does that shift who I am and how I show up in the world? And that to me was just like amazing. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. And, and yeah, you know, I, I like to use sometimes the word attunement, right? Um, so I think every microsecond, if, if, our, if we're sufficiently aware of what's going on around us, every microsecond, the universe is sending us messages that we can pay attention to, um, that, that relate to opportunities for further attunement, for further understanding. And so the game of life, I think, is about understanding and, and, and attuning to to what is and to the extent that we integrate that into our experience and learn the lesson, right? And I think if we don't learn the lesson, then the universe is really good at just beating us, beating us into a pulp <laughs> by sending the same message over and over and over again, we start to get victimized and get into lower levels of consciousness. It's not fair. And, you know, and it's just like, well, you really, you know, <laughs> one of my friends, she's like, you know, all the guys in the world, they're exactly the same. And it's like, no, they're not. You're just attracting the same one over and over again because you haven't learned the lesson that uh, that you need to learn. And so it's 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 that sort of thing that I think when people get that, and it's such a it's such a minor but but massive. It's a minor distinction, but a massive shift uh, that allows the game of life to be played from from a very different perspective. So, what is some of the areas of research that you think is really cool and cutting edge? Because you had spoke about, and and I think to speak to your point about um, having all of this available and then people being able to kind of interact where they're where they are and so a lot of the research now like you said is on addiction and you know hearing uh what was his name Michael Pollan and he wrote uh, I think he's written two books now on psychedelics yes. and he talks a lot about how to use it more in a, a you know to deal with some of the the mental health issues and addictions and um but what do you find is some of the coolest, like, what are you paying attention to as far as research around psychedelics? To be perfectly honest, I've kind of tuned out. So I've been super privileged. My, one of my major motivations is actually to do more to connect 
the spiritual understanding to the scientific leaders um, in terms of research. Um, and, and part of the motivation for that is because I think this, the, the psychedelic science with all the love and respect and belief um, is still pretty, what's the right word? Um, Poor? No, that's not the right word. It's it's behind. Like the the understanding in the scientific realm is so much more limited um, and still deterministic in terms of its approach to to this work relative to the spiritual understanding. So um, there's there's a couple different businesses that I'm collaborating with to try to improve the quality of the conversation. I think new stakes need to be put in the ground in relation to what's positive, uh, what's possible. I think one of the most exciting papers that I've seen more recently is in relation to epigenetics in plant medicine. Um, and so we've got, it's the first paper that's evidence that yes, indeed we can reactivate new genetic material by virtue of working with psychedelics. So that's very exciting. I think, um, again, the, the spiritual understanding in relation to this is that, um, Typically, two strands of our DNA is is active. I'm not I'm not super scientific, so bear with me here. We can activate all twelve, um, and so a lot of the guidance that I receive from from my spiritual mentors is about steps to activate next strands of, of DNA, and which is a, a, which is I think in relation to some of those things that we that science doesn't recognize, but spiritual. Uh, understanding does so things like telekinesis you know telepathy all of these sorts of things that are described as that's not that's not possible um you know i think i think it relates a lot to dna activation and so that's that's an area that i think um i think we're just at the very beginning of and i think will prove very exciting over time because um that is yeah it's gonna it's gonna help us unlock more and more human potential over time Oh, I love that. I love that idea. And I know what you're saying because so much of the research that's happening is still so confined by the constructs of the like the Western medical model. That's that's exactly it. And, you know, I heard um, one of the leading leading researchers, he's giving um, vomit suppressants to uh, to clients before they go into therapy. Now, if you vomit during a therapy, you know, I, the face that you just made is exactly right. Like if you vomit during therapy, it means that something very significantly like something energetic and very significant is coming out of you. Uh, and so it's very powerful in relation to the the benefits that one might gain from the experience so actually suppressing that and then you know there's other there's other um, researchers out there that are trying to do psychedelics without the um that are trying to do psychedelics without the visuals and all that sort of stuff and it's like wow like you know, or, or trying to do 20 minute psilocybin journeys and all of this sort of I, I i dare describe it as kind of old world tinkering uh and there's a lot of energy out there that's like people trying to patent and control and say like well i've got the best this and i've got the best that and you're like guys Guys, like we have these plants, they're amazing. We know what to do with them. There's, you know, there's this beautiful, great therapeutic knowledge that sits in the West. There's this, um, you know, ancient wisdom and energetic knowledge that sits uh, in the Andes and in you know, parts of the Amazon, etc. Let's bring those two together. And then we've got all the pieces that we need. But of course, like, you know, the human condition is, is such that it is that people want to, to command and control. So it'll be interesting to see how it all evolves. I think that's kind of what I was getting at with my question about as, as they become more mainstream, do they lose a bit of their soul? And so that idea that um, you would try to su suppress when the body's in, I mean, part of it is the purging, right? <laughs> that's a really important aspect of this work. And to try and suppress that means that you don't really get it. You don't really understand <laughs> what's happening. And uh and not that I could, like I said, there, there, I, I, I have experiences that I have no words for. So there's, it's not about understanding intellectually, but uh, appreciating that there's some really deep, deep work that's happening on every layer of your being. Um, and so to try and manipulate or control that, which is, you know, supposed to be by its very nature expansive, um, seems like we are kind of off the mark there at the same time you know hearing some of my i've listened to some really long-form podcasts with michael pollan and him sharing some of the research of you know people being longtime smokers and then having a you know taking i can't remember which psychedelic it was and being able to see from that perspective see themselves and understand what that was doing to their body and and then that experience of self-love 
coming in and saying, oh, I love myself too much now to do that. Like that to me is fantastic. So if that is happening, I guess, you know, um, we got to take everything as it, you know, how it comes. But I appreciate what you're saying. It's sort of when I'm hearing that, I'm thinking about like psychology where psychology likes to look at the deficits, the defunction, dysfunction of, in mental illness. And then there's positive psychology that's like, no, how do we help people thrive? Like, instead of looking at it, the negative, let's look at it at what, how does this tap us into our deeper human potential? That I'm glad you, I'm glad you raised that because I think it relates perfectly towards to, to the title of your podcast, actually. So it's become very popular, I think, in, in modern times in particular for people to do this, this shadow work, right? Looking at the elements of self that they don't like. And I think that's, you know, there's a place for that, certainly. But my experience and, and guidance from the spiritual mentors that I've received and have really helped me after my, my years of mistakes, if I may describe it as such, that um, they... You know, you really, we really want to be using these powerful tools to move towards the light, right? Um, that's, that's, you know, of course, consciousness exists in polarity. And so we have, you know, the, the chaos and the darkness down here. And, you know, we have uh, more, more of the light uh, up there. And, and that refines into, you know, finer and finer uh, points as we move, move higher and higher up. But the, you know, the, the reason I, the reason I raised that is that, the things that need to come out of the shadow, out of the chaos, um, will come up as we're trying to move up into higher states of consciousness, because that's fundamentally, that's the energy that's keeping us from reaching a higher state of consciousness. Our natural essence and our natural state is to rise in consciousness, but there's something stopping us and we need to release that thing. So as these medicines you know, move us up into higher states, then what happens is that the dissonant energy that's keeping us from reaching that higher state becomes amplified. And so that's our opportunity to work with that energy um, because it becomes amplified and, and, and process it and, and is our doorway into reaching still, still a higher state. Well, how do people prepare then? Because you had you had told us your story about kind of being cast into this without uh, preparation. If people are are contemplating um, attending a retreat like this, what what would you say to them um, as far as preparation? Yeah. So um, you know, first and foremost, we 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 got our clients through um, understanding who their future self is, right? So you and I could be anyone in uh, in in a year or two's time, right? Uh, you just need to decide who that person is going to be. Uh, and so helping clients get super clear on future self, you know, these medicines do respond to intentionality. So the greater extent that we anchor. A, a belief in that future self, then the, the, the greater the plants are able to respond to that. You know, I've heard a story from, from one of our healers that um, there was a, a client working with Iboga in Africa who meditated on his intention every day for like six months prior to the medicine work. And his, his, his intention was to finish on this plane. I've never heard someone set that intention before. But so in one ceremony, he cleared this life's karma and all past life karma. And about two weeks after the ceremony, he meditated out, meditated out consciously. He wasn't necessarily that old and he wasn't unhealthy either. He meditated out consciously. So it's not something that we're looking for from our clients, obviously. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's that's an example of when when you really anchor around intentionality, what what can happen for for someone. Um, and so we, we really help clients get clear on future self, which is usually, you know, great, great health, great relationships, passion for the stuff that I'm doing, balance in my life, lots of love, peace, joy, all of those sort of hobbies that I that I really get a lot of energy out of, all of those sorts of things that, you know, we, we pretty much universally share, but helping them get really clear on that. And then we can surface, okay, well, that's your future self. Why isn't that you right now? Uh, and so that's when the work begins, right? So that's the mental and emotional work. So what's going on up here and what's going on in the physical body that's keeping that uh, future self from being realized like, in this microsecond. Um, and so usually, you know, that's some work with the coach and the therapist. We teach tools for the metacognition, right? So becoming more conscious of thought patterns and limiting beliefs. We teach tools for emotional processing and emotional release. Um, you know, and if, and if clients come to me now and say, hey, you know, I'm thinking about doing a plant medicine retreat, but I, it, uh, either we can do this transformation thing or I can do this plant medicine retreat. Like virtually, I would say most of the time, it's like focus on the mental and emotional work, the plant medicine retreat. It's like, it's a powerful tool. It's great. But actually for a lot of people, what they actually need is the mental and emotional work, but they want to go do this experience, you know, somewhere. And it's like, yeah, but 
do the mental and emotional work. That's that's where the magic happens. And so um, that's you know that's the way that we work with clients, helping them release those things that are that are not them, uh, so they can come closer to their true selves. So that's a lot about you know a little bit about the preparation um, and also self inquiry. I would ask, I would say, is the is the is the third element that is you know super important. So just we uh, we have a series of questions for clients to get to know themselves much better than they than they do now. And so, you know, it's, it's pretty, um, it can be pretty illuminating what people actually think of themselves. Uh, and people often don't think about what they think of themselves. And so when they write those things down, it's pretty confronting, uh, you know, just to say, well, that's, that's actually how I see myself. It's, uh, I mean, it can be heartbreaking, to be honest. Yeah. Um, is there what, as far as nutritional stuff, do you think people should do some fasting or anything like that prior to, or just, yeah. So for ayahuasca, it's very important to, um, to, uh, follow the dieta, right? So two weeks, two weeks prior to the retreat, um, we, we prescribe a pretty strict diet, uh, with the other medicines. It's also a good idea. Uh, look, I always tell people, look, this is energetic to the extent that you are honoring this experience is the extent to this experience on being able to honor you. Um, so if you're meditating every morning on your intention, eating really clean, going for a run, uh, avoiding all those things that, you know, avoiding the media, avoiding all of those things that just drag you down, then uh, then you're going to have a very different experience than if you were, you know, carrying on with some of those habits that uh, might might have been your norm or might be your norm, but aren't energetically aligned to who you might become. Well, we are almost up on time. Is there anything else you want to touch on that we uh, that you think is really important? I would encourage anyone thinking about exploring this to take their time and do their research. Um, and I think um, developing your own individual motivation is very important. You know, I think we we're, we live in a time where this work is becoming very popular, which, you know, given what I do is, is great. But at the same time, I, I always encourage people to spend a lot of time and energy educating themselves if they're scientifically minded, which most of us are, um, look into the research, see how you think you might benefit and, and why you feel really drawn to, um, to, to work with plant medicine. And then again, know why you want to work with that plant medicine, why you want to go to that retreat center. Um, so really spend a lot of time understanding exactly where you're going, why you're going there, all of those sorts of good things. Because again, all, it's super difficult in my experience to find a transformative experience versus a psychedelic experience. And everything out there at the moment is just rated as far five stars because it's, it's you know, these are profound experiences. And because it's rated as five stars, it tells us two things. One, people are having very good experiences. And number two, people are not able to discern quality. Um, so if we went to Airbnb and saw everything was five stars, you would just be like, uh, this thing is fundamentally not serving its purpose, right? Uh, and so th again, that just indicates that we are just at the beginning of something that is very exciting. And so, um, you know, the, the, the moment that I started working with healers that knew what they were doing, I just remember looking at them like, okay, like I was excited about plant medicine before, but this is just on a completely different spectrum. And so take the time and the energy to, um, yeah, to find, to find the experience and to find the transformation that is going to, is going to serve you best. Uh, where are the different centers located? Um, at the moment, we mostly work in Netherlands, Portugal, uh, Mexico, and Costa Rica, and we will reopen in Peru shortly. And has COVID really, is there a lot more uh, complications? You know, we work, we do a lot of our work privately. Um, you know, I, I don't hesitate to share that all, like virtually 98% of the progress that I, I feel like I've personally made has been in a private setting after years of attending group retreats with the bucket. So, um, so you know, we do a lot of private work, uh, which obviously, you know, COVID doesn't really restrict so much. Uh, and then we do much smaller groups as well. So, you know, typical retreat is, is 20, 25 people. We tend to do group size of five to eight um, oh. Wow. It's a much more intimate sort of container, which, you know, doesn't mean that there's, you know, 100, 100, you know, what is 25 times 24 times 23 relationships being formed <laughs> within a large group, which is a lot, right? Especially when you throw in an extra, you know, a facilitators and coaches and cooks and all of that sort of thing. So we energetically for us, we like to, to keep a smaller container, which is obviously helpful as well, given the, the COVID situation. 
Well, awesome. How can people learn more and what's your uh, uh, website? All of that good stuff. Yeah, you can uh, find us on Behold Retreats. Um, we there's no bookings for us. You have to uh, you have to come through a human. So it's there's no book now button. <laughs> Uh, our, our events are by invitation only. And again, that's so that we can manage the right energetics and, um, you know, get the right sorts of people together. As I shared, we don't really focus too much on the people who are really suffering. We're, we're more focused on the mind expansion. Um, and so, yeah, if, uh, if what I've shared is uh, resonates with some of your audience, then come and check us out and have a chat. Well, I want to thank you so much. I love your energy and uh, I really appreciate it. Um, just the way that you speak about it, I can tell that it's something very dear to your heart. So thank you so much for coming on the Chaos and Light podcast. Thank you, Angela. It's a, it's a beautiful podcast you're doing. Uh, well, we will be right back after this ridiculously short break. Are you enjoying this podcast and want to help this lady out? Well, share it with friends or even better, leave a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear from you. Now back to the show. Well, that's it for today's episode. Uh, coming up on the next episode of Chaos and Light, we have Dr. Jean-Michel, and we are talking about her intimate relationship with Mary Magdalene, how this led her on a pilgrimage across Europe to connect with some of her sacred sites, and what Mary Magdalene has taught, about, taught her about uh, the age of partnership um, and the resurgence of the sacred feminine. So that's it. Take care and seek the mystery.